Hey, Patrick Pandaro here, managing partner at Visa Franchise. Excited to have on Alona Semkovic, a managing partner at Semkovic Law. She's actually based here in Miami Beach, just the other office over from us uh, at Visa Franchise. Alona, thanks so much for joining today. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. U.S. immigration attorney Ilona Shumkovich here. Uh, in today's video, we will be talking about the E2 visa. Uh, the E2 visa is an exciting opportunity for people looking to invest and grow their businesses in the United States. So whether you are an entrepreneur or just getting started, understanding the ins and outs of this visa can open doors to vast possibilities. Alona, I've seen you work with a lot of investors, special ability, because I've seen the flow of clients, uh, not not just from your native country of Poland, but it seems like all over Europe as well as all over the world. So it's exciting to watch your, your practice continue to grow and uh, look forward to talking today about the E2 visa in particular. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, we do have a lot of, a lot of clients, uh, mainly from Eastern Europe mainly from Poland. Um, however, we, we do handle clients from basically all over the world. And Alona, can you briefly explain what is the E2 visa and who's it kind of an ideal fit for? Uh, the E2 visa is also known as a treaty investor visa. It is a special U.S. non-immigrant visa that is designated uh, to facilitate foreign investments in the United States. Uh, the E2 investor visa allows people to enter and work in the United States based on an investment in the US business. Um, it was created to allow citizens of certain countries that have a, an E2 treaty with the US to invest in a business in the United States so they can either invest in a brand new startup company or they can purchase an existing company. And based on that investment, they can get an E2 visa to operate their business in the United States. Um, it is a great option for investors, entrepreneurs, business owners, and others to come to the United States to operate their business and grow their business in the United States. Um, the issue is that people often don't know which business to invest in and they ask us about what would be the best business for an into visa investment. Um, what is very important is to remember that the business must be active. So there is uh, no possibility to get a E2 visa for a passive investment. For well, example, you can't buy a house and get an E2 visa. Exactly. That's what I was referring to. A lot of clients come to us and they're asking, hey, can I buy two um, condos, let's say in Miami, rent them out and get an E2 visa through that investment? So, no, investment in a residential real estate just to rent it out to a single tenant. Would not yeah. qualify you, you for need a lot of doors. Visa. Like we've had uh, maybe 70 clients do real estate property management for the E2 visa, but like long term residential in the business plan, like at least 50 properties to, to justify the job creation of having a few Americans. And then short term rental, we've had as little as 12 properties where they're, they're going to have cleaners and staff, but that's usually the magic number. I'd say 10 for short-term rentals and then more for long-term residential. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. If if you are going to invest in a real estate, it has to be on a much bigger scale yeah. than just, just a few, few apartments. Uh, that's why I, in my opinion, an ideal uh, E2 uh, investment would be, uh, let's say, a retail store, uh, a restaurant, a cafe, uh, a real estate, let's say, development company, or even any business that is offering services like uh, consulting, um, healthcare clinics, uh, financial services, a fitness or a wellness center, or purchasing a franchise from a well-established brand can also be a solid E2 visa option. Uh, as a quick disclaimer, this is not intended as the investment advice. The of purpose course. of this live stream is to help you understand the E2 visa process and narrow down your poten potential 
business endeavors. Uh, so please know that while we will provide valuable information, it is essential to consult with the qualified um, professionals or immigration experts for personalized guidance. And Alona, you know, we're focused on the E2 visa, but how does it differ compared to some of the other visas for entrepreneurs or investors? Uh, yeah, so one key distinction between the E2 and other investment-based visas, such as EB5, is that the E2 does not require a large of an investment. Uh, additionally, it is uh, a non-immigrant visa, meaning that it does not directly lead to a U.S. permanent residency. E2 visa holders can reside in the U.S. as long as they maintain their investment and meet certain criteria, but it is not a direct path to a green card. I personally like an E2 visa because you can renew it indefinitely, meaning you can review it for the next 40, 50, 60 years, comparing to other visa that are capped and can be renewed for, let's say, five years, like an L1 visa. Um, E2 visa also does not require a physical location in the United States. Uh, it is nice to have it, but it is not required. Um, when it comes to uh, transferring from an E2 visa to a green card, uh, there are, as I mentioned earlier, there is no direct path for that, but there are many options, meaning that when you are on an E2 visa in the United States, you can consider uh, a self-petition for, uh, for example, EB2, National Interest Waiver Green Card, which is a great option as long as you meet additional criteria. Uh, for example, if you have um, an educational background or uh, certain achievements in your field, it is great to use your uh, E2 um, business uh, to qualify for a EB, EB2 National Interest Waiver Green Card. Uh, other options would include EB1, a green card, which is an extraordinary ability green card. Uh, of course, uh, that option um, requires more, uh, more of a showing of a talent of a certain uh, petitioner. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, even though E2 visa does not give you a direct path, you can stay in the United States. Um, <laughs> For many, many years, as long as you're, you keep your investment active, you can also switch to other investments, meaning, let's say, um, your business, uh, maybe it's not uh, something that you want to keep doing. You can literally uh, close your business, you can sell it, you can reopen a new business, reinvest that, uh, that fund, those funds and uh, uh, get a new E2 visa for that new investment. And uh, Ilona, you mentioned some of the investment requirements, like the substantial uh, nature. Are there other requirements? And how has this been kind of evolving uh, during your time working on E2 visa cases? Uh, when it comes to a, a key requirements for an E2 visa, I think it's important to focus um, on the on on ba uh, first of all. Uh, on making a substantial investment. So um, the amount that is considered substantial can vary, but depending on a business. However, it must be a sufficient to ensure a, the successful operation of the business. Um, the investment requirements have evolved over time with a focus shifting from the strict dollar amount to a more flexible approach that considers the proportionality of the investment to the business type and size. Currently, the regulations do not specify what dollar amount is considered substantial. In our firm, we recommend investing around 100,000, uh, but it does not mean that investments for less cannot be, cannot be approved. It is important to understand that not all businesses are the same. For some businesses, an investor can easily spend 100000 to get the business up and running. 
while for other businesses types, investor might struggle to find ways to spend that money. Um, you can consider a restaurant business versus an online store or a service-based business. For service-based business, you might need to, you know, get creative, uh, for instance, by investing in marketing or some other services. So that would be the first, uh, first thing that we would need to focus to make sure that we are making that substantial investment in order to be approved for an EB2 visa. Uh, another um, key to get approved for an E2 visa, we need to show uh, that investment is at risk. That means that the money you invest in the U.S. business must be used in a way that, involve, that involves some level of risk. Uh, you have to show that your investment was is irrevo irrevocable. In other words, uh, you have to show that there is a chance that you could lose that money. So you cannot just park your funds in a safe or a low risk yeah. investment. You need to act actively use the money to help the business grow. Um, I, I know escrow is permitted, but we've actually had a few denials where they were using an escrow account. And we still have clients applying through escrow, but it's definitely not my preferred option. Like ideally they spend the funds and we figure out a, a plan B if they, they don't get the B2 visa after a second attempt. And our years, I mean, we've had hundreds of clients and I've only had two clients try it twice and not get the E2 visa. And those are pretty much for personal reasons and not related to the actual business. Yes, that's correct. Uh, that's correct. Uh, I, I personally don't like this uh, uh, this arrangement for a E2 visa. I like to show that you know that the the funds are actually at risk. I personally had no clients that were stubborn and wanted to do it their way yet. So maybe that's why we did not have to deal with denials. <laughs> but um, I mean, it is something definitely to explore further. And Alona, what are we talking about in terms of like the process timeline, working with your firm? How long does it take? Some Say someone's pretty organized and they've documented their investment. What's the general application process look like? Well, the application process really depends. Uh, depends. <laughs> depends if uh, a client chooses to do that within the United States or just to go through the consular processing. Uh, there are two ways to obtain an E2 visa. Uh, most people apply for, a, for the E2 visa at the consulate, which if approved would allow uh, usually for multiple entries to the United States, again, depending on the country. But for those who are already in the United States on some type of other visa, for example, H1B or F1, there is an option to apply for a change of status to an E2 visa within the United States without leaving the country. If approved, it would grant an applicant a two-year status. However, since this is not a visa, they would need to apply for a visa at the consulate if they are planning to leave the United States. For this reason, if they are planning to leave and, and re-enter the United States. For this reason, we always um, advise our clients to apply for an E2 visa at the U.S. consulate ab abroad. The general application process at U.S. consulate involves filing form DS-160, scheduling a visa interview, and paying the visa fee, of course. And during the interview, applicants should be prepared to discuss the details of their investments, business plan and intentions in the US. How long that process takes? Again, it depends on a country. Um, the preparation process, if the client is communicative and provides all the information, all the, evi all the documentary evidence on time, might take about um, two to four weeks to, to build the, you know, the, the application package. Yes. Um, However, um, again, if we're doing that in the United States, there is an option to pay for a premium processing, meaning that the client can pay 
2500 to the USCIS for uh, expedited processing and get a decision within 15 business days. Um, if the premium processing is not uh, requested, then it can take as long as four to seven months to, to get a decision. Uh, when it comes to a consular processing, again, it depends on a country, but uh, with many countries, uh, as soon as we um, submit all the documents to a US consulate abroad, it can take about four weeks to, to get an interview. So it, it is a pretty quick process. Okay. And what documents, you mentioned the form um, showing like the the funds that have been invested, I'm sure receipts, but any other documents that are typically required for the E2 visa? Well, yes. Uh, typical documents would include a business plan and evidence uh, of investment, of the investment, proof of business ownership. Um, it is important to show that the company will employ at least three U.S. workers. We like to do it that way, at least. Uh, within the five-year period, if you are buying an existing company, the business might already employ three people. So you would include company tax and payroll records with your application. Uh, however, if you are creating a startup, startup company, on the other hand, you would include a business plan showing uh, hiring projections for the next five years. Um, other required documents, I mean, we can take a step back and maybe talk about the preparation process. Uh, generally, the step number one would be to register a, a U.S. company within the state where you're planning to, uh, to operate your business, getting an EIN number uh, that is assigned by the IRS, opening an operating account for your business, transferring the funds. Uh, so we like to show how the funds were transfer, transferred from your personal account abroad to the U.S. account. Uh, so we would be showing the trace of the, of the trace of those funds. And also, as you need to invest the money in the business, uh, we would need to, we would like, we would be showing all those um, <clears throat> spendings that you made, for example, uh, let's say purchases, uh, invoices for the purchases of equipment or uh, expenses for marketing or, uh, let's say, a, a lease agreement, anything that is related to your business. Okay. And Alona, are there any recent updates, changes to the E2 visa application process that are, are worth mentioning today? Uh, okay. Recent updates. I'm not sure if it's an update, but I... I, I I heard from uh, from my colleagues that there has been issue with uh, E2 visa approvals because of uh, uh, not enough evidence shown when it comes to intent to depart. Uh, as you might be aware, as you might be aware, an E2 visa is a non-immigrant visa, and you need to show that you have an intent to depart once your visa expire or before your visa expire. So how do we show that? We would draft a letter for our client's uh, signature uh, stating that he is aware of it. Uh, the client is aware of that, uh, of that requirement and um, acknowledging that he will be departing the U.S., uh, on uh, before the visa expiration date showing that he has he does not have an immigrant intent to stay in the united states um often if the client has an ownership in a foreign asset for example if the client owns a house or any commercial real estate in the in the foreign country or if a client has uh, children in a foreign country that do not have a desire to move to the United to come to the United States uh, with with that person with that client, we would show that you know there are family ties in the in the country abroad in the country where the investor is from. We would show that he has uh, some type of in, uh, ownership 
uh, in, as I mentioned, uh, residential or commercial real estate, or maybe does he have o that he has other businesses in the United States, just to show that, you know, that there is something that the investor needs to come back uh, for once his visa expire. Um, other, other updates. Um, I believe it was back in May. Back in May this year, uh, there was an important update for spouses and children of uh, E2 visa investors. Uh, this was an important change regarding what's called derivative beneficiaries. So there is a principal applicant, which is an investor, E2 investor, and derivative beneficiaries who are uh, the spouses and the children. So the principal applicant is the one who applies for the E2 visa uh, and the derivative beneficiaries are spouses and unmarried children under 21 years old who can join the, applica uh, the applicant and obtain their, their own E2 visa. Uh, when the principal applicant has a different citizenship than his or her spouse or a child, the availability and terms of an E2 visa can be different depending on the countries they are citizen of. For example, let's say uh, I'm a Polish citizen and my husband is a, a Canadian citizen. Uh, citizens of Canada can receive a five-year visa that allows for mul multiple entries du during those five years. On the other hand, citizens of Poland can obtain an E2 visa for 12 months period. Or, for example, a citizen of Egypt can only obtain an E2 visa for a period of three months that would only allow for a single entry. So, so you got to come right away and that's it. You're stuck for two years, I guess. For two years. Once you enter, you get a status for two years. Yes. So in the past, in the past, if the principal investor investor had different citizenship than, than the spouse or the children, everyone would typically receive a visa for the same period as that principal applicant. However, with the recent updates to, uh, to the E2 visa program, uh, there are new rules in place uh, when a principal investor, for example, from Canada, um, receive his E2 visa, his spouse, who is a Polish citizen, would uh, receive an E2 visa only for um, one year, for one year, for 12 months. Uh, however, for example, if, um, if I, am a, I am a principal applicant, I'm from Poland, I can get only 20, uh, an E2 visa valid for tw uh, 12 months. However, if my husband is from Canada, and even though he should qualify for an E2 visa that would be issued for five years because he is a derivative beneficiary, his E2 visa would be shortened accordingly to the principal investor uh, visa, meaning that he would also get a visa for just 24 months. So well, his, no, visa, for... his visa would be capped oh. at 24 months. I'm sorry, 12 was... months, 12 months. Before we dive into some of the questions that were coming in, we have at least five questions from, from the audience. Um, any comments on the renewals? Because your practice, you deal with a lot of E2 visa holders that are only getting that 12 month E2 visa, where most lawyers, I would say, are, are, are dealing with petitioners that they're getting the five years and the renewal is not as big of a deal. But for you, you know, the stakes are high. Um, any advice in terms of the renewal and, and best practices to to make it easier for you and the uh, the applicant to get their E2 visa renewed? Uh, well, we always prepare our clients uh, for renewals. Once the client gets approved for an E2, we always make sure that they know, you know, how to document their spendings and how to how to collect all the documentary evidence that would be uh, needed for a visa renewal later on. Uh, 
Um, but mostly we would reuse an initial application. We would reuse it and we would add additional documents and update a business plan. So we would do some changes to a business plan, showing that the business is growing, if it is growing, uh, and showing prediction for additional years. And we would also show that the business uh, was op uh, is operational and that it is you know, ac actively engaging in business. Uh, um, that's about it. So the best way to show it, of course, is to include all the financial records of the investment, like business financial statements and tax records. If the business has employees, we would show all the payroll records. Um, and, and that's about it. Uh, you know, with Poland, they would be, for example, like Poland, because it's only 12 months um, valid, validity period, they would be more liberal. So they don't expect your business to grow crazy within the first two, three years. But of course, the longer the business uh, is active, the more expectations they would have. Uh, so it is always, you know, important. The most important is just to focus on growing your business, doing your best. And as long as the business is operating uh, well, there would be no issue with the renewal. If what I've seen is like, pretty much across the board, whether it's E2 visa or other categories, like the US government wants money. So you're making money and you're paying taxes, payroll tax, you're as an owner, you're paying tax on the profits and jobs. So if you're not doing one of those, then the, then I guess it's, it can be hard to renew where we've had clients where they have like eight employees and they're not making much money personally, but they, pay a decent amount in payroll tax and they uh, they have a lot of Americans on the payroll and they're still able to get the renewal. Definitely. As long as, you know, you, you hire U.S. employees, I don't see that there could be an issue with renewing an E-2 visa. Um, the issue that I see is when the enterprise is marginal. A uh, marginal enterprise is one that only provides enough for the E2 investor and their family. Yeah. And that would be probably, uh, you know, something that we don't want to show because we want to show that the business has some, some level of success. So as long as there is certain income or enough to, you know, hire at least one, two employees in the United States, I'm not worried about renewals. Um, so we have a question from Natalia. If I get the E2 investing in a franchise, could my husband work on anything he would like, even have his own business? Yes, this is actually uh, um, a very good thing about the E2 visa. Um, when a spouse comes to the United States as a derivative beneficiary, that spouse gets an E2 visa that actually give that spouse more freedom than the principal investor has. Because that person, that spouse, that is not a uh, principal investor, that person can work and do whatever, wherever and whatever that person wants to do. So it's not obligated to the, to the investment that qualified that person for an E2 visa and can work for other employers and can run other businesses. Opposite to an E2 investor who is only limited to work within the E2 investment business. And then we have a question from Mina Sadia. If you have $1,000 in your bank account and spend almost 5,000 in buying stuff, buying product, uh, I'm planning to start a wedding decor business. Um, I'm assuming she's asking if, if that type of business is, is eligible for the E2 visa. Wedding decor business? A wedding decor business, and she's only invested 5K in physical products and has another $1,000 in working capital. Uh, well, it's $100,000. It, it is like. 100000 And how much was invested? 5000 It looks like $5,000 was, was invested okay. and then $100,000 in the account. Okay. I like the business concept. It's a, it's a nice concept for an E2 visa. 
my understanding uh, is that there is a hundred thousand available that were transferred to the United States. So we meet the criteria that criterion that requirement of investing a substantial amount of capital into a US business. However, now we have to spend a substantial amount. It looks like she's corrected it where she spent fifty thousand. Is that enough 50, or you want more or you want more spent? Fifty thousand. Okay, okay, okay. Um well, I think what I would need to do, I would need to renew a business plan at this point to understand the business concept a little bit better. But I think she is very, very close. After spending fifty thousand, uh, we can we can definitely, with a good business plan, show that this has been a substantial amount of that investment. There is what is called. Um, proportionality test. In simple language, proportionality test checks if the amount of money you put into a business is a big enough piece of the total cost of that business. So if your investment is the same as the entire cost, it is a substantial investment. But most businesses, it's not the same. So for example, imagine uh, if the business cost a lot, you can put a lower percentage and it still would count as a substantial. That's like a factory. It's like a $5 million factory. You don't have to exactly. invest like 3 million. Yes, exactly. You can just put uh, one, um, I don't know, uh, 500,000 and it can be still a substantial amount. Uh, but with a wedding decor business, I do believe that 50,000 can be considered a substantial amount. I would encourage my client to probably spend another fifteen or twenty thousand before submitting an application. But um, it, it looks like a, it looks like she's close. And then last question from um, Stock. Uh, I'm probably mispronouncing the first name. Hello, is there a way you would recommend making the application process easier? Easier. Okay, the easiest application applications processes for me are the ones when the client is just fully focused on his business, his or her business. That's why I always recommend clients just do not stress out about the uh, visa process. Just focus on growing your business, on, um, you know, just uh, making arrangements for your business so that everything works well for you. And as long as you really focus on something, if you're confident that you want to do it, uh, you are uh, you're going to do well and there would be no issue with getting an E2 visa. Uh, what is very important is to get an attorney uh, engaged in an early process, uh, an initial stage, have someone who can advise you because sometimes I see clients that come to me uh, that already established a business in the United States and then they send money to the US through a friend account that comes from the country that they are not from and just, you know, there is a lot of uh, mess to show it uh, clearly to the US CIS officer. So that's why I like to keep things simple. I like when the funds are located on my client's foreign account um uh, i prefer when they are on a personal account because we don't have to sh if it's a business account again we have to show that the business uh, you know uh belong to that person and it's like more evidence that we need to that we need to gather so keep it on your personal account keep it for some time to show that the funds were really yours if you got it from a parent from whoever make sure you get a gift letter and then just transfer the funds directly to an operating account in the United States, to a business bank account, to make it very easy, very clear, and very simple. Uh, I think it's it's important because otherwise it just um, it's you know it causes it makes us showing the way of the trace. It makes tracing the funds a little harder, and then. It, you know, the process is just harder. And working That's in parallel with Alona, we 
at Visa Franchise, we can help open up the LLC, get the IN, business bank account in all 50 states. And there's a few online banks that our clients usually will, will choose and will help facilitate that process. And then when they're here, they can open in person with a Chase, Bank of America, and, and later transfer those funds from the online and bank accounts. So we can work in, in parallel with Ilona in terms of um, getting those non-immigration steps like with the business, finding the business, analyzing the business, um, and um, basically everything that's needed to succeed with the business. Where working with Alona, it's more on you getting the, the visa approved in a, a timely fashion. Um, Alona, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you, you know, discuss their personal case? Is the E2 visa, maybe it's not even the best option for them and there's a faster option that's less expensive. Uh, what's the best way for for those that are interested to schedule a consultation? Um, the best way to contact me is via email. Uh, it is info at shrimkovichlaw.com or by calling our office at 725-300-7005. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we just put your email up on the screen. We'll be sure to include that in the description. And uh, I just want to thank you again for, for joining and, and sharing your wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Patrick. Thank you. Bye-bye.